Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Klaus van der Tempel. I'm a program maker at Studium Generale of the TU Delft. I have organized today's lunch lecture together with uh, Joop and Jan of EA Delft, Effective Altruism, a new student organization. They're going to tell you more about themselves later. Um, we have a very good speaker today. I'm going to hype the heck out of him because he's been all around the world. He's an author. He's a strategist. Uh, Tobias Lehnart. He wrote a book a few years ago called How to Create a Vegan World. And you've been touring the world talking about different strategies of making that possible. Um, you're also the co-founder of ProVeg International, which is a food choice awareness organization. Am I saying that right? Uh, yeah, food awareness organization. Food awareness, okay. And that's also some part of the topic that we're going to talk about today, animal welfare, which of course is intimately tied up to our choices and what we eat. Um, I don't know if anybody read the news yesterday, but in passing, there's mentions of you know tens of thousands of birds being killed in the agriculture industry because they might be sick. Well, this kind of news happens all the time, and it doesn't really affect how we operate as a society. We're going to talk today more about that, about pets, about wildlife. I think the distinctions between how we look at animals and why we treat them the way that we do. So, we're going to have a lecture of about 30 minutes. Afterwards, there's a chance for Q and A. We're going to turn off the cameras after that. If you need to go to your courses after that, you're free to go. The rest of us, we're going to stay here for a more informal discussion with Tobias and with EA, sorry, with EA Delft. So without further ado, I'd like to give the word to Tobias. And please give him a, a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to the people organizing this and to all of you for uh, being here. So yes, I'm going to um, talk about why animal welfare um, matters. Uh, I was already introduced, so I'm going to skip this. The, um, the framework or the background for uh, this talk or the content that I'm going to deliver is a philosophy and a movement called Effective Altruism. And it's also uh, Effective Altruism Delft uh, that is organizing uh, this this uh, talk today together with uh, student uh, generale uh, and I'm going to explain in a few uh, minutes what effective altruism is about. It's um, like I said a movement and a philosophy that was coined or started among others by uh, this guy Professor William McCaskill at University of Oxford who is uh, I think the uh, youngest ever uh, professor um, over there. Professor in uh, moral uh, philosophy and he wrote a book called doing good better. So how can we do good in the world but how can we do it better than we have been doing? And the idea there is that we're going to look at explicitly the link between two things, between the heart, between empathy, which kind of like allows us or, or moves us to help to help others, to make things better, and on the other hand, our brain, our rationality. So we're going to help uh, in a way that is based on uh, rationality, on uh, scientific resources, on research, etc. Right? Not just based on our gut. And I'm. Um, Maybe to you that is all, as, as, as students here at the Technical University, that is all very obvious, but it is definitely not obvious in uh, the world. Let me give you some examples of how that is not obvious. This is, um, you know her, Mother Theresa, uh, and she says, I, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. Is that clear to you what it means? If I look at big masses of populations, that are their statistics, right? There are millions of people and I will never act. But when I see that story of that one individual child that is needy, that is need, in need for help, then I will jump into action. And that is something that's very logical and natural to us, I think. Uh, we are moved by more uh, individual stories than by huge numbers. But it, as it is at the same time also very problematic. And we know, for instance, from research that uh, when people send out these, when NGOs send out these letters uh, asking money, asking people for money, and they would say, for instance, uh, something like, this is Sarah in some African uh, country, and she's hungry, and she needs your help. And they compare that to another letter where they say, where they talk about Sarah and um, all the other victims of famine in her country. Do you know where people give most? It is here, which is not very logical, right? 
even uh, when they talk about Sarah and her three brothers who are all, uh, imagine that they're all hungry and starving, etc. People will still give more here than here. So our brain is a bit like, um, I would say it's buggy. It's full of bugs in terms of, of where the attention of our empathy is going. Here's another example that shows that we're not always looking for uh, impact and rationality and evidence and results. This is um, a thing that um, a device that uh, an organization was promoting, an or a Western organization was promoting to put in many uh, African uh, villages. It's called a play pump. And it's a, it's a play thing, as you can see, that at the same time pumps water out of the ground. And if you just listen to your heart, if you have one, uh, this sounds very beautiful and warm and fuzzy and you get warm feelings. Like, oh, these children are playing and they pump water out. Oh, this is a delightful invention. And so this organization indeed got a lot of support and, um, and celebrities were ambassadors for it and they raised a lot of money and there were a lot of these things installed everywhere. But it was done without evidence, without any serious research. And they only did the research afterwards. And it turned out that, well, these children, as children are, they got very tired of it very soon, right? And so what happened was, well, these things were there, and then it was the women sitting on these things and pumping the water out of the ground, which was not very dignified for them to do. And then they tired of it as well, and these things were left to rust. They just sat there. So that's a very clear example of um, how doing things just based on warm fuzzy feelings uh, is not good enough. We have to combine it with rationality and evidence. Okay, so in the end it is about making a difference, making a difference in this world. And maybe this quote is a bit um, too fuzzy for you engineering students, but I'm going to read it anyway. The secret of life is to have a task, something you devote your entire life to, something you bring everything to every minute of the day for the rest of your life. And the most important thing is it must be something that you cannot possibly do. Maybe this is discouraging to you because there's no solution apparently, but to be involved in a project for your entire life, a very big daunting challenge, I think that is part of the meaning of life. And that is also what can help make you happy and make you satisfied and content in this life. So I'm just saying that because when you want to help others, it's not just others that you're helping, it's also a better thing for you. It also gives meaning to your life. I think that's very uh, important. I mean, maybe you don't realize that or you don't know that yet, but you can, you can take it from me. I'm, I'm 30 years older than you. All right, so if you want to make a difference, if you want to help, there's so many options in the world, so many things to do. There's the poor people and there's people who are suffering from natural disasters and there's people who are um, old and people who are, or children who are sick, etc. And there is also, and this is what I'm talking about today, there's also the topic or the space of animals. And maybe some of you are already have this idea of like, yeah, okay, you're just showing that there's so much human suffering in this world. Why should we then help animals? Why should we help them um, while these are suffering? And some might actually say, no, we should focus on these first, these beings first, before we address the problems of non-human animals. And uh, as a vegan or as an animal rights activist, which I have been for 25 years, I have uh, numerous times uh, run into the question of people like, why would you help animals Why, while you could help people? And in this talk, I want to give an answer to that. So... Um, in life, we can um, make or we have to make a lot of choices. You had to choose your field of study here and you have to choose what movie you want to watch on Netflix tonight. Uh, always choices. I think that um, making these choices is a lot easier if you have a certain um, framework or an algorithm or a heuristic uh, to make them. And the heuristic that or the, the framework that we're using in order to help people or to look at uh, who we're going to help in this world in effective altruism boils down to three criteria. Three criteria being uh, the scale of the problem of an issue. How big is the issue? How many uh, people or beings does this issue affect? How many are victims of this problem? Right? The second one is how many people are already doing something about it? And that is how neglected is this problem? 
So a problem that is more neglected might be more interesting to work on than something that is already getting a lot of resources. And thirdly, how easy it is, is it to make progress? Is this problem what we call tractable or solvable? Right? If it's not solvable at all, if we cannot make any headway with it, then why should we be involved in it, even if it's very big? Right? So these three together um, provide a framework by which or on which, through which to uh, evaluate a certain issue and to evaluate our choices as to where we're going to put our attention. Let me go over these and apply them to the topic of animals. So scale, where is the larger, largest number of sufferers? That's the uh, first part of this um, topic or this criteria. We are 8 billion people in the world. Many of them don't have it good enough. Uh, other people have a, a reasonable um, level of quality of life. We have about 1.1 billion cats and dogs in the world. I think that many of them have a reasonable quality of life. Some have better quality of lives than many humans. Um, but there are, of course, also uh, a lot of, uh, of cases of abuse and neglect and abandonment, etc. So this does deserve some of our attention, obviously. But the big problem in terms of animals and animal suffering is obviously in animal agriculture. And I'm going to uh, give you like an in infographic-like uh, um, picture or illustration of the numbers involved. So these are the farm animals, farm mammals that are alive at any one moment throughout the year. So these are rabbits, goats, pigs, sheep and cattle, uh, cows, animals that we eat in the world. That's 5.5 billion animals. But there is something missing here. What is missing in terms of what we eat? Yes, chickens is missing, so I'm going to add chickens, and this entire pie now becomes uh, just uh, this one. So we are now at 34 billion animals at any one moment alive. What is else is missing here? Fish. fish is missing. I'm going to first add the fish that we raise in aquaculture, so we don't catch them in the sea, but we raise them, and if I add them, then this happens. So farmed fish is all this. And what else is missing? The other fish, the ones that we catch in the sea, and then this happens. Does that, then we are at 1,600 billion animals. I could add more. I could add insects, but we don't know if they're suffering, etc. So let's keep it at this. You're already uh, probably um, <clears throat> subject to what we call psychic numbing. So this is the fact that your emotional response goes down as the number of lives as, as the number of lives at risk increases maybe that's different with you engineering students but with normal people <laughs> that the case is that um, the one story is much more appealing and 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 motivates people a lot more than uh, like the quote from mother teresa said than these huge numbers right but that is the reality so an incredible amount of lives being affected in this case by the food that we eat secondly in terms of the seriousness of the problem, where is the most intense suffering? And of course, scale doesn't matter much if the problems are not so huge, right? I mean, a light headache is not the same as, as cancer and chemotherapy or something, right? Or permanent migraine or whatever. So we have to look at how intense the suffering is. And I think that we can say that in factory farming, the suffering is really um, immense. And it's not so easy, of course, to um, point out um, what um, or how bad that suffering is. It's not easy to compare ourselves to um, others, to other beings, not even to other humans, but also to other beings. Uh, for instance, uh, pigs, how intelligent are they? We know that they're more intelligent than dogs. We technically should not be doing anything to dogs that we, to, to, to pigs that we are not doing to dogs. I think that's a very rational thing uh, to say. Uh, we also don't know, for instance, is it worse uh, for an animal to be in a cage or is it less bad for an animal to be in a cage than it would be for a human? Some people say that it's worse for humans because humans can create narratives about themselves and they can think about the future and they can think like, oh my God, I'm going to be in here forever. But maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the animal cannot think about the future and therefore has no hope or expectation to ever get out. And the now, that terrible now that it is in, is the only thing it has. Its whole existence is being trapped in that cage, right? So it is really um, hard to say. In general, if you want to look at which 
animals have it the worst, then um, research is pretty confident that chickens uh, have some of the worst um, conditions, um, living conditions of all the animals that we eat. And um, I could show you a lot of horrible images that if you have a heart, will leave you depressed for for a couple of days. I'm not going to do that. But just one thing, because you mentioned um, the, the the chickens that were um, uh, killed for for uh, avian influenza. I just saw, saw one video of 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 the of the things that they try. I mean, they were experimenting on chickens to see what was the most humane way of killing a large amount of chickens. And so you have gas and you have uh, ventilation shut down, etc. And there was a video that leaked from one chicken that was that was suffocating because of ventilation shut down and took it 91 minutes to die. And it was horrible to see this from just one chicken. But there were millions like that, literally millions. So. I just want to say that the, the, the torture that we afflict on animals is beyond doubt and is shameful and is something that has to stop. Whether you think an animal has any value or not, uh, whether you think a human is more important than an animal or not, the torture and the suffering is um, beyond any doubt and again needs to stop. Fish also are um, quite um, numerous victims of our eating habits and especially um, the fish in aquaculture, but also fish that we catch in the sea. Situation is not good for them, they have a free life, but the killing of these animals is not regulated. You have to stun a mammal, but a fish that you catch in the sea, you can just, uh, you can just let it die and that can take hours. It's not like with us, when we are submerged in the water, we die in, in two minutes, but a fish can take a couple of hours to die. And we can, um, this way we can, calculate what is called a suffering footprint. How much suffering is involved in a certain product? And for instance, here you see that a piece of, uh, a portion of cheese of 100 grams would, according to this rudimentary research, equal five hours of suffering. Or for instance, uh, one portion of eggs or chicken meat would equal two days of suffering. Or one fish would equal 30, its entire life. We, we, we assume here that it's suffering every day, uh, so entire life is suffering, so 31 days um, suffering um, is involved in the eating of uh, one portion of fish. Secondly, neglectedness, what is and what is not already being done. These are two earthquakes, one in Haiti, one in Japan. If you uh, had 100 euros to spare to donate to either of these natural disasters, where would you donate it to, if you had to choose? Haiti. Haiti. You don't like Japanese people? Yeah. Yeah, very good. So they're 40 times as rich, so that means that they have an easier time rebuilding, and that also means that the buildings were more, were better, the structures were better and that there were a lot less dead than there were in this case. And yet, for these two disasters, aid organizations collected twice the same amount of money. Right? But if you take into account the idea of neglectedness, if you take into account where can I make the most difference, then you would definitely choose to give your donation here. So that is the idea of neglectedness. Where will my help, my money, my intelligence, my time, my resources, where will it make the most difference? And if you look at what we do in, in terms of animals, in terms of donations, these are numbers for the United States and um, I assume they will be pretty similar for Europe. Of um, all the money, of all the donations that are being given to good causes in the United States, 99% goes to human causes and 1% goes to animal causes. And if we zoom in on this 1% of animal causes, what do you think we will see? Yes, pets, dogs and cats, shelters. So of this 1%, only 1.5% goes to farm animals, right? So what goes to that 70 billion to those 70 billion animals, farmed animals a year, 0.015% right, of the money. That is very high neglect. And then thirdly, tractability. What can we do about this problem? So there is immense suffering, it's on an immense scale, it is neglected. 
can we make progress? So this is a child, sorry for the graphic image, this is a child suffering from smallpox. And smallpox in the 1980s, early 1980s, was declared dead. Thanks to vaccinations, we managed to conquer smallpox and that was one of the great victories of medicine and of science. We could declare it dead. Could there be a day, and I don't know if you already think that this is desirable, I certainly think that this is desirable, this is a restaurant somewhere, but, and it's titled, uh, or the name of the restaurant is Meat is Dead. Could there be a day when, just like smallpox is dead, that meat is dead? That we don't have this incredible mass suffering anymore just for our food and our taste buds? I think that is definitely a possibility. I mean, if you look at other social justice movements in history, anti-slavery, women's liberation, LGBTQ liberation, for none of these movements have we reached the end point. But for each of them, we have made tremendous progress. And I think there's no reason to think that we won't be able to make the same progress in terms of uh, the animal liberation um, cause. Especially because, actually, the solution is, I wouldn't say easy, but it's elegant. It's simple, in a way. The thing that we need to do is to convince 8 billion people to change their diet. Right? If they do that, if they switch to a plant-based diet, we will have eliminated 99% of all the human-caused animal suffering in the world. Right? So that is, in a way, an elegant solution. And I think that this is perfectly doable. We can get there. It doesn't look like that because um, if you look at the history of uh, meat consumption, then we've seen that the last 50 years it has been growing tremendously. And it is still growing. We project that by 2050 it will still increase by 50 to 70 percent. Why is that? Because countries like uh, China and India together, one third of the world's population, they are eating more and more animal products because they are get, getting richer and richer. When a country gets richer, a higher per capita income, they tend to eat more animal products. And of course, the populations are also still growing. So the um, number of animals is still going up. And for now, if you look at the market share of meat substitutes, it is only 0.7%. So 0.7% of all the meat in the world sold is uh, a meat alternative. That is very small. If we would um, uh, be able to have the same growth of the sector that we are seeing the last year, the so growth of 10% a year, then we would catch up with meat uh, production in the year 2050-2060. Then it would be even, meat substitutes and meat. don't know what you think of that number. For me, that's still slow and I would want it to be faster, but um, that's still significant uh, progress. I think it can be faster. How can it be faster? Well, one thing that people are doing, activists in general terms, is awareness raising. Raising awareness like I've been doing in this talk of the problem, basically telling how bad the problem is, trying to make people care, right? Of course, no matter how hard you explain, not everybody is going to care. So you can do this individually. Some people have YouTube channels, um, etc. So um, this is um, another way that um, another way of inter intervening. Uh, this is not necessarily changing people's attitudes, not necessarily changing people's compassion or motivation, but it is changing the product. It is um, helping chickens to lead slightly better lives so that when people continue to eat chickens there are at least chickens that have a better life this approach has limitations because um, i mean to give it like a really satisfactory life a life that we would want to have it's going to be economically very very difficult right there's other things that people are doing um just comparing these two this is an, an, an activist um who uh, found an organization to help chickens. This is also an activist, but he founded a business to help chickens. He founded um, the, um, um, a, a business to, um, uh, he created, uh, for instance, mayonnaise that, has, that doesn't have chickens, that has, have, doesn't have chicken eggs in it, right? It's called Just uh, Food. So they create products that help to take the chicken out of the food chain. 
that is another option. I mean, if you can give people the exact same products, then they can eat them without necessarily caring about animals. They, sh they switch to these products even though they don't care about animals. That is another uh, approach. So uh, beyond meat, impossible foods, etc. And also very importantly, cultivated meat or cultured meat, which I think you know is meat from uh, stem cells that we are going to uh, put in a vat and give energy. And um, that way we create actual burgers, actual meat that is from animal cells. So here people would not know or see the difference with real meat. This is real meat, basically. So these are uh, different uh, strategies. Um, if you uh, look at this uh, picture, this is a, a one idea of the landscape of all the different companies, startups that have or that are developing alternatives to um, animal products. So that is a very uh, thriving field that is very promising. So at the moment, if you if you ask me, like like okay, what are you expecting most? Um, help from or most results from the attitude change, the awareness raising among people or the providing of alternatives. I think that lately we're more making more headway with this, just creating alternatives that help people to stop eating these products just because the new products are just as good. We talked about the cheese. You said it was okay. Um, it has to be better than okay. It has to be better actually than the than the original. It has to be as at least as cheap it ha or it has to be preferably cheaper. It has to be healthy enough. It has to be environmentally friendly. Um, so all these things uh, have to come together. That is quite uh, a challenge, but it is, I think, doable. And another uh, game changer here could be uh, government support. This is the total um, investments by governments in alternative proteins, so in these alternatives for animal products, the total investments worldwide, and then we have uh, $500 million worldwide. That is actually peanuts. $500 million worldwide by governments to address this incredible problem, incredible problem that is not just animal welfare, but also environment, sustainability, health, public health, etc. All this together is addressed with just 500 million uh, of government money. If you compare that, for instance, to this, uh, that is 350 billion dollars that the Biden administration in the US has uh, allotted for one year for the energy transition for mainly uh, electric vehicles. So compare this to this 0 0.5 um, billion. Um, if ever a government would take this issue as serious as it takes this issue, that could be a complete game changer. And I think we're starting to see that happening. We're starting to see that governments are getting um, into this, starting to understand this. Actually, the Netherlands is uh, quite a good example of some progressive uh, politics. On the other hand, um, they are governments are still uh, doing a lot of things wrong. There's, I'll get to you. Uh, they are uh, giving subsidies still to all kinds of harmful agricultural practices. They are still, while Europe is, for instance, saying that we all should eat less meat, they are still giving a lot of money to advertise meat to the uh, animal sectors. So um, it is a very ambiguous message that um, the um, European government is spreading. So, um, in terms of solutions, let me summarize changing awareness and attitudes by advocacy, changing options, creating alternatives, and then governments to um, create a level playing field, level playing field, and to make um, things easier for companies to bring them uh, to the market so that consumers can more easily adopt them because they're cheaper, uh, more environmentally friendly, etc. So um, that is it. I think that um, if we look at animals and human animals, to say it like that, there is no reason to ignore the non-humans, particularly because the scale of the suffering is very intense. The suffering is very intense. So. Um, while, of course, we have to address human suffering as well, we have to really take animal suffering very seriously, especially because it is a problem that we caused. It's a problem that finds its origin with our eating habits. We have responsibility, I think, to solve it. And I think that um, it would be a good idea 
like everything that we all the other problems that we tackle it from the framework of effective altruism where we look at what really works what really will make a difference and um, i hope that uh, you too are convinced or can get convinced of this issue and that in your personal life or maybe in your job you want to do something you want to change something you want to help find or create solutions for this incredibly important problem Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a question there. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, yeah, we have some time for questions now, guys. Anybody, if you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll come up to you with the microphone. I'll hold it, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, my first question was, what is the Netherlands doing then for uh, ALS protein at the moment? Well, there's... Um, um, I forget the details, maybe one of you knows better, but I think there's recently um, a, a, a package of, uh, I think, 80 million uh, euros for uh, as subsidies for uh, all protein companies, I think cultivated meat companies and some others. 80 million um, euros, I mean, it's not huge, but it is still, I think, um, after Denmark, uh, the second country in the world to do this. Um, so that is pretty spectacular. And uh, even before, many years ago, there were uh, um, already subsidies to investigate alternative protein. And that was the Netherlands were one of the earliest uh, to actually do that. Also, in terms of, of companies, in terms of uh, clean meat, cultivated meat, uh, the Netherlands is, is, I think, ahead uh, of most countries, certainly ahead of Belgium, my country. Um, but uh, there's important work being done in the US, in Israel, and in the Netherlands, I would say, in, in, um, in that field. So, um, yeah, well ahead. Why is it not on the chart? Ma'am, I'll get, I'll get to you in a second. We have a follow-up question first. I'll get to you. But I have the microphone, and otherwise we can't hear it in the recording. Then why is it uh, that it was in Netherlands not on the chart that you were showing? Um, this chart was right from right before that, uh, those subsidies, yeah. It was very recent. And yeah, you're right as well. The Netherlands is one of the worst in the uh, bio industry, like yeah. chicken-wise. We're the epicenter of uh, chicken farming, and yeah. well, the, we're not that good. we're not doing good at all. We're one of the worst in Europe with everything. So, what about you? You're you're also exactly right. Um, so, the Netherlands is one of the biggest um, uh, countries, or the most important countries in terms of um, animal agriculture, that is exporting uh, an incredible amount of um, volume uh, of animal products to other countries as well. Um, but uh, at the same time, there is this research into uh, alternative proteins. Um, so, you have both, and I think you have a lot to make up for. <laughs> so, that's maybe a start. Anybody else? Belgium is very bad as well, so I'm not going to badmouth the Netherlands especially. But. Um, thanks for the presentation, it was super interesting. How far would uh, making people switch to a vegetarian diet go towards improving animal welfare compared to an animal free diet? Compared to a vegan diet? Yeah, there is a slide in here that I didn't uh, show in terms of that uh, suffering footprint, uh, the number of days, and it shows that actually um, when you replace, uh, in certain circumstances, when you replace uh, a meat product by a vegetarian, non-vegan product, that can make the suffering actually worse. It depends what you compare with, but um, in a vegetarian diet you might have a lot of eggs, and eggs is one of the worst things actually. Um, it, like I said, it depends what you, which things you compare. For instance, if you eat a lot of beef, um, beef is quite bad for the environment, but in terms of animal welfare it is better. Why is it better? Not just because of the way the cows are treated, they're treated better than uh, chickens usually, but also they're a lot bigger. So if you want to have the uh, same amount of meat in terms of volume that you get from um, from one cow, if you want to get that meat from chickens, you need 200 or 300 chickens. So there, there was a, a campaign uh, many years ago by by PETA, the American Animal Rights Organization, and they it was kind of a joke, but they said like eat whales, eat whales because I mean the bigger the animal you, you eat, um, the less you're gonna kill and the less animals are going to suffer. So bigger animals is usually better, all terms being equal, um, all other things being equal, uh, than smaller animals. Like fish is also very bad because they're also small animals. Yeah. 
you talked about uh, governments uh, possibly investing in, in solutions for this problem. Uh, what do you see in uh, governments possibly doing in terms of uh, discouraging people from eating meat in terms of taxes, for example? Yeah. Uh, do you see that as a solution? Yeah, definitely. It can definitely be a part of it. Um, we are at the stage in in this evolution or in this movement where we are still seeing that and, and the climate is, is such that people are very quick to say like, oh, government shouldn't meddle with this. They shouldn't tell no, they shouldn't tell me what I can eat and what I can't eat. So that is still very much the case. So governments are very, very wary to get into that. Uh, but um, another initiative from the Netherlands is called the TAP Coalition, which is a coalition of different organizations that try to get a fair price for meat. And one of the ways to get a fair price for meat, which would be a higher price, is to, um, to uh, have a tax sort of tax tax system. And um, this tax system would, for instance, uh, be uh, the tax would be levied on meat products and it could be collected to help make plant-based products more uh, cheaper. And uh, the research shows that um, if you frame it as the government helping people, helping people to do something that they already want to do because everybody would like to eat healthier but they're not succeeding because they get bombarded by all these advertisements so they're up against a big force and they cannot do it alone so in a sense government has to help you know and if you frame it like helping then it seems that uh, a lot of dutch people are going along with that uh, idea more and more people so maybe the climate is is getting more and more ripe for for this kind of intervention can I ask a follow-up question, Tobias? Because we had a, a bit of a controversy recently at the TU Delft. I'm sure a lot of people here heard about that as well. The Faculty of Architecture, they decided that the cafeteria was only going to be serving, I'm not sure, I can't remember if it was vegetarian or vegan food. And there was quite a bit of backlash to that. Some yeah. people were supporting it, but other people said, I should have the freedom of choice of what mm -hmm. I put in my mouth. Do you think that that uh, is a, a rational approach to the problem? Which one you mean, the, the intervention or the, the reaction to the, it? Sorry, the intervention, the choice of yeah. taking away people's choice. Yeah, I, I think that is a matter of time. So um, we are taking away choices all the time. When something gets too bad, when there's a public support, enough public support for it, the choice disappears. Like we can no longer get these oiled, or how do you say, glow, glow lamps instead of LED lights or whatever. There's no choice anymore. And people could say, oh, I still want to have that lamp. Uh, but at some point, we all agree, no, it's not good. Uh, we're just going to, we have good alternatives. We're going to uh, do away with it. In terms of like doing something like that in, at a university, it uh, depends on the audience. Um, I think uh, it can be rational. What I would um, mostly, I think, be in favor of at this point still is uh, working with the default option, making the default option vegan and then make it very difficult if people still want meat. So make it either more expensive, make it so that they have to like register a day beforehand to get meat the following day, something like that, so that you don't entirely take the choice away. People can't complain that there's no choice anymore, but you make it more difficult. So so the, the, the idea is always to make the desirable behavior behavior easy and the undesirable behavior more difficult. So that's that's choice architecture. Right. Anybody else have a question? We have one over here. Back there. Well, I would like to react on that because um, actually the students from architecture asked the dean to make the canteen or the restaurant uh, vegetarian. So you can see that that population is indeed interested in more vegetarian or vegan food and about the default option at this moment at this university we're trying to make the banqueting so the food that you just ordered for this um, the, the vegan option the default and uh, the secretariats have to make an extra step to yeah. uh, ask for meat so at this moment we're really working on that yeah yeah I think that's that's a good move um, and I think what you said about the architecture students asking for it it's probably a part of the architecture students right maybe the most aware ones and the other ones were I mean was everybody in favor or <laughs> just well, we did several tests before and yeah 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 I mean no problem then if there's enough support for it and fine more great uh, yeah great yeah so if it works there maybe it can work here or in other places yeah I have a question back here. Yes, uh, I have a question about slightly different but still uh, somewhat similar topic. Uh, yes, vegan diet is an alternative and to 
remove suffering somewhat. But uh, is there anything that can be done in terms of medical testing? Because maybe we cannot really give away the medicine mm -hmm. in terms of yeah, animals. Yeah, yeah. So I focused here on um, on animals in 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 the food domain because that is by far the biggest area and. Compared to that, animals in medicine in research is is quite small, but still it is it is very important also because the suffering there can be really horrible, um, and I think that there um, yeah we are seeing progress. I mean it, it's it's more and more difficult to use animals for these purposes, and we are also I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I know that we are having more and more alternatives um, to to. Um, to actually um, to work with and to, to do these tests with. Uh, I can understand that some people say, I mean, it's easier. I mean, if you look at food, food is more trivial than, than medicine, right? So um, it's easier to say, like, let's stop using animals for food, probably, than to say, let's stop using animals for medical research. But we know that in a lot of cases, the medical research does not require the test or the test can be done somewhere else. So we need we need an attitude uh, change uh, there too, and we need uh, scientific alternatives for those tests. Yeah. Um, I wanted to react on the tax on meat because that has been shown to not work because it just creates more classicism because the poor people cannot afford and then they're going to see it as an elite product and the rich will just spend more money on it. So that has been shown to not work as a way to make people eat more plant-based food. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, there, is, there, there are some um, people saying that and there are some studies showing that. There's also other um, theories showing that it would work. It depends on how big the price difference is, things like that. Um, I think it, it would be especially interesting if the um, money from those products would be used to make healthy food uh, cheaper. So um, in that case that you would have like a really advantage for uh, underprivileged people uh, as well. Yes, so. But then you're already punishing maybe the less privileged people that are might not have already access to vegan products that in our society yeah. are already not easy to access for everyone. Yeah. So you're making the gap or the transition even harder. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think that to some extent it would be unavoidable because, um, I mean, people are always going to have like, I mean, there was always going to be differences among people in terms of what they can afford. So, I mean, for now in this system, in the present system. So, so this is where I disagree also <coughs> mm -hmm. and also on how you I wouldn't want it to be like that. I want it to change, but I think for now it's gonna gonna be like that for a while. But yeah, we can this discuss. Could be that. a good discussion to continue in the second part after the Q and A. Does anybody else have questions? We have a few more minutes. One over here. Um, I don't really have a question, but more thought because um, yesterday in Volkskrant, I read a column uh, about someone who was um, against uh, insect farms because some research shows that insects can actually feel pain and they try to avoid it. So we would replace like the big animals by even more mm -hmm. very little animals. So I'm, and um, those farms are getting subsidies from uh, some provinces here. And I assume that is also called alternative protein. So yeah. I think um, um, the alternative protein is not steered by uh, trying to avoid animal suffering, but um, more like the climate problem and environmental issues. Sustainability issues. Yes, and yeah. the animal welfare. It's it's both. I mean, um, so alt protein is is yeah a, a term that that um, comprises a lot of things, but. Um, the, at least the people working for animal welfare, when they address animal protein and when they address the protein shift, uh, insects are not part of the solution. And we really want to um, rule them out exactly for the, 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 the reason that you're quoting, uh, because we, we're not sure yet, but if those animals would have feelings, would have a subjective awareness of what it is to be an insect, then we just possibly aggravating the problem that way. They might be good for uh, climate to, to obtain climate objectives, but in terms of animal suffering, they could be very bad. And and can you imagine like if we're gonna like breed billions of pigs and then feed them 
trillions of insects that's just like a, a, a horror scenario so yeah i i, I think um, it should be stopped before it goes too far and bef before we're dependent on it and before we cannot get rid of them anymore yeah. all right thank you guys for your questions we have run out of time lunch break is over so i want to thank everybody for coming today those of you who are sticking around stay seated for a minute the rest of us uh, and actually everybody let's give tobias a last warm round of applause thank you, thank you.